Good evening. If everybody wants to have a seat, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, good evening. Welcome to Maui Ocean Center's Sea Talk series. My name is Colleen Foster. I'm the Education Director here at MOC. Tonight, we're going to learn a little bit more about the science and mystery of coral spawning. But before we get started, I'll go over the format for the evening. The talk will go from about 7 o'clock to 7.45, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. So please do hold your questions until then. And then we do like to try to end on time at 8 o'clock, uh, but our speaker has graciously said that uh, she will answer questions while we're breaking down the room uh, after that. And if you don't have a question, you can always help us by grabbing a chair. Um, so tonight we are pleased to, uh, to uh, welcome Pauline Feeney. Uh, she is such a well-known and respected member of the ocean community that she hardly needs an introduction by me. She is a biologist, she is a business owner and operator, she is an author, she is an award-winning diver, and the namer of nudibranchs. Uh, so, um, you know, tonight she's going to share a little bit of information about her studies of the patterns of coral spawning here in Hawaii. So without further delay, please join me in providing a very warm welcome to Pauline Feeney. Hi, everyone. David, yeah, can you, is there, is there a way to take this light out of my eyes or, no? I might have to come out here. Well, anyway, thank you guys all so much for coming tonight so that I get to talk about one of my favorite things, which is coral spawning. Um, has anyone here ever seen coral spawning in the wild? Wow, cool, so lucky, huh? And um, have any of you been to the aquarium on the night where they've they've had the coral spawning event? And you've seen it in the in the tanks. Yeah, you know it's so special if you uh, if you ever get the chance to do it next year. Um, biologically speaking, coral spawning is one way that corals reproduce, and um, it's a way that they can mix their genetic material and also how they can disperse um, far away, miles away from where they where they started. But it's not just some um, isolated series of chemical reactions. It actually involves the Earth's um, trip around the sun. It involves the, uh, the uh, gravitational pull of the sun and the moon on the Earth and on the Earth's oceans. It involves moon phases. It involves the time of sunrise, the time of moonset. And there's an element of mystery to it, too. Um, so I first became aware of coral spawning um, about 30 years ago when I was leading a dive. And this is what we looked like back then. This was the fashion. Um, they made us lead dives in little wetsuit tops, and we just froze. Um, we also had to walk to the Kihei boat ramp. It took 15 miles to get there in the snow, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just leading a dive one day in April, um, and I noticed that there was smoke coming up off the bottom. And I went over, and then I could see that it was coming out of this particular kind of coral, which is called um, cauliflower coral. And of course, I didn't know what that was. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin and in a Lutheran family, and we, we did not discuss coral spawning around the, <laughs> around the supper table. So, and Google and Siri hadn't been born yet, so I, I didn't even know. I don't even know how I found out what I had seen, but eventually I, I found out that it had something to do with coral reproduction. And, um, and so, I saw. I thought, wow, I am just incredibly lucky. I can't believe I got to see this. So then a couple years went by, and I got to see it again. This time it was in, April, in May. The first time it had been in April. The second time it was in May. And I thought, oh, my gosh, who gets to see this, you know, twice in their lifetime? 
Um, then the next year I saw it again and I'm like, okay, forget it. This is not, you know, this is not coincidence anymore. So I went back through my log books and I saw that, um, and I got moon calendars out and I saw that this coral was spawning, um, one to three days after the full moon in April and May. And since then, my wonderful crew and I have uh, been collecting data for the last 20 some years, and we've gotten a much um, clearer picture of the pattern of this, how, you know, this coral and, its, and, and, and how it spawns. Who are these animals called corals? Um, the Hawaiian word for coral is koa, and Ed Lindsay taught me that koa koa means having abundance or being well supplied. So the early Hawaiians knew that corals were the key to uh, the abundance of our nearshore waters. And I think you can tell from this picture that if this coral colony weren't in this picture, none of these fish would be either, right? And so I try to picture what it would look like underwater w if there were no corals. And Dave Fleetham uh, loaned me this photo to show, um, he took this off of uh, Lehua Islet, off Kauai. And you can see that with no corals, they're pretty much, you know, there are pretty much no fish there. Compare that with this, and you can see that corals are providing millions of hiding places for all kinds of creatures. Uh, they also provide food in the form of coral polyps for fish and other organisms. And uh, they produce mucus, which is another food source. But even as critical as corals are to, to the uh, um, abundance of our nearshore waters, they're, they're kind of hard to get to know. For years, uh, hundreds of years ago, people thought that corals were stones. And you can imagine if you were along the coastline and you were able to see into the water, of course, you know, we, we all would have thought those were, were stones back then. Um, then when naturalists were able to see corals up close and they could see those little flower-shaped polyps, um, there was a period of time where corals were considered to be plants. And I found this, um, this mention in an old text in the 1800s that talks about um, the reason that coral made such a wonderful building material for Hawaii's roads. And they said that it was because it was easy to cut underwater where it was a plant, and then it hardened up nicely on land into stone. So, you know, there was great confusion about what, where to put corals in the, you know, natural taxonomy world. Eventually, corals were recognized to be animals, and they were placed in the animal kingdom. Um, so I'll introduce you to a single coral animal, which is called a polyp. And a single coral animal is um, basically a sac-like gut cavity, and it has a single opening that serves as both the mouth and the anus, and it's surrounded by stinging tentacles. And so one of the ways that a coral feeds itself is that a planktonic animals drift into the tentacles and they get stung by stinging cells um, that are in, in the tentacles and they're paralyzed and then that tentacle passes the food into the mouth of the coral. But that only supplies less than 20% of a polyp's nutrition. What's supplying the rest of it are these microscopic single-celled algae. Um, and they're, they're, they're really tiny. These are just groupings that you're seeing here. And they are photosynthesizing, and they're giving about 90% of what they produce to the coral in the form of food. And in return, they get a safe place to live, and they get nutrients from the um, metabolism of the coral. And of course, the relationship is much more complicated than this. But those are the, the main things that I want you to, to know are that the zooxanthellae are producing 
the majority of the food for the coral polyp. And they're also helping the coral polyp secrete that calcium carbonate skeleton. The coral couldn't live uh, without the, these algae. It wouldn't get enough food, and it wouldn't be able to build that skeleton. So these microscopic algae are the reason that corals are known as the reef builders that they are. So each polyp secretes a little circular uh, cup-shaped skeleton to protect itself. And the skeletons are different patterns and shapes depending on the species. So these are two different species of coral, and they construct those little um, calcium carbonate skeletons in different, in different patterns. And you can see in this picture how deeply they can withdraw into that little cup-shaped skeleton if they need to for protection. Now corals, healthy corals, are always reproducing um, asexually. They are multiplying their polyps. So um, one polyp will, uh, can divide in half or, oops, sorry, the um, new polyps can bud off of, of existing polyps. And I think you can see in this picture that um, if the colony stayed the same size and didn't grow up and didn't grow out, all those spaces would eventually fill in, right? And there'd be no room for growth. So a coral colony is always growing upward and outward um, in order to allow for new, for new growth. All of these polyps are genetically identical. The, the colony, is, the polyps are just cloning themselves. So this is just one individual um, genetically. As the coral is growing upward and outward, the existing polyps have to keep up. Otherwise, they would just get paved over by the new polyps. So you can see in this picture that the, all these little chambers, <laughs> sorry, all these little chambers um, are a single polyp that keeps raising itself and secreting a new calcium carbonate skeleton, and raising itself and secreting a new skeleton. And they have to just keep doing this their entire lives as high as the, as the coral grows. So theoretically, some species of corals can grow indefinitely. And there are some huge colonies off of Olawalu, as some of you know, um, some which can potentially, possibly be hundreds of years old. And some of them are really discreet like this, and you can make them out um, from Google Earth. That particular colony right there is, looks like this underwater. This is that colony. So there it is from the air, and this is that exact colony underwater. And it's 33 feet in diameter, so and estimated to be hundreds of years old. And the advantage to a huge colony like this is obviously nothing is going to grow over this and shade it out. No algae is going to be able to, you know, go over it. Um, when you're this massive, you know, you're kind of king of the reef. But there is a disadvantage to this, um, to being this big, and we got to see that in action last year. So last year, as you know, we had this um, severe bleaching episode. This entire colony bleached, and we were just, you know, crossing our fingers and hoping that it would recover. But actually what happened were, uh, was that most of the colony died, and now there are just little centimeter, two centimeter patches of living coral um, around it. So effectively, that was the end of that circular colony. It is no longer going to grow in that beautiful formation, and, and, and that's the end of it. So the disadvantage here is that that entire 33 feet of coral, because it was all genetically identical and it couldn't handle those bleaching conditions, that entire 33 feet of coral is, is gone. Whereas, if that area had been occupied by colonies of different genetic makeup, potentially some of them might have survived, which is the case. This is the colony right next to it. Came through beautifully. And it's the same species of coral, 
you know, environmentally, it's right there. And it's not that there was any great environmental difference between the two, you know, locations of these colonies. Um, but just genetically, this colony was able to, to meet that challenge. And so that is the reason for coral spawning, so that they can mix their genetic material and create colonies of different genetic makeup that will potentially um, survive different conditions. But in corals, this is tricky. This is, a, this is a one little coral polyp. And let's say he has been eyeing a coral polyp on an existing colony. And he would like to spawn with her. But then he realizes he is stuck in place. They are all stuck in place. So what corals have learned, well, have, have uh, evolved to do is to release their eggs and sperm into the water and hope that they come into contact with each other. And that's called coral spawning. And there are many ways that this happens. Um, if you say, you know, if, if I say, oh yeah, I've, I've seen coral spawning, it's kind of like saying I've heard music. There are just so many different ways that they have, you know, come to do this. So some spawn, most of them spawn at night, some spawn during the day, um, some release, some species release just sperm or just eggs, some species, the colony releases both eggs and sperm. Um, some bundle the eggs and sperm, some release them separately. So there are just so many different ways that they accomplish this feat. But the, all, the thing that they all have in common is that they have to synchronize the release, right? If a colony um, you know, our colony puts a lot of energy into producing eggs particularly. Some, in some species, it takes the entire year to get the eggs ready to spawn during their spawning season. So if a colony just released its eggs in particular and nobody else around it did, that would be a huge waste of energy. Not to mention the embarrassment. So, so colonies have, have, have to release those eggs and sperm within a tiny little sliver of time, a 15-minute sliver of time, out of the entire year. And to just imagine how uh, impressive that is, let's say we want to meet back here exactly a year from now, um, you know, between 7 and 7.15 at night, and we get no calendar, we get no watch, <coughs> we, don't, uh, we don't get a brain, we, we don't have eyes. Um, you know, would even one of us be able to just sense when to be back here? So the way corals do this is they use the only timekeepers they have, which are cues in nature. And the, the cues that they use, some of them, are the time of year, uh, the phase of the moon, and the time of sunrise or moonset. And if you think about it, all these things are just forms of solar energy in different, in different forms. Um, so most corals are, are spawning near the new moon or the full moon. And the reason they have come to do this is because <coughs> of the tides. The moon is exerting um, gravitational pull on the ocean side that's facing it. And it's also pulling the Earth a little bit towards it as well, creating a, a bulge on this side. So as the Earth is rotating through these two high sides, those are our two high tides, and then our two low tides. When the sun and the moon are lined up, when there's a new moon and when there's a, a full moon, they are combining their, their pull. And so that's pulling the water away a little bit farther than it would be when the, the moon and the sun are opposed. So those higher and lower tides um, create more tidal flow. And for corals, that's a good thing, because as soon as you spawn, it gets your eggs and sperm away from predators on the reef. 
and it also helps disperse those new larvae to um, to new to new locations. So let's see how this all works in the situation or in the species of cauliflower coral. Um, cauliflower coral spawns in the spring, in April and May, like I said. So they use the warming water temperature to make sure that they've got their eggs and sperm ready during the months of April and May. So they've got their months nailed down. To determine what days in the month they're going to spawn, they use the full moon. So cauliflower coral spawns one, two, and or three days after the full moon. And then lastly, to know what time on those days they're going to spawn, they use the time of sunrise. And so, um, you know, it took a lot of years for us to average the, the data and come to realize that they were using the sunrise as the time um, that they queue off of. They, they spawn 80 some minutes after sunrise. And so sometimes we, we are uh, out there with people um, trying to show them this incredible thing and we get underwater and we are, you know, we're, we're there, you know, just at the, you know, the right month, the right day, the right time. And we're sitting there just hoping it's going to happen. And sometimes, you know, we can't even tell by looking at it if it's going to happen or not. There's no swelling. There's no color change. There's no dilating. There's no... There's no water breaking. Well, <laughs> who knows? Maybe there is. But we can't tell if it's going to happen, and sometimes nothing happens. And so there's this final factor that is involved in whether the corals spawn or not, which is that they're communicating chemically. So we can't tell if they're going to spawn one day after, two days after, or all three days after but they all seem to know. And it's extremely rare for just one colony out of the thousands of colonies out there to get it wrong and just spawn and nobody else does. They're communicating and they've all somehow come to this understanding that it's either going to happen that day or it's not going to happen that day. And this is something I don't think we will ever know. I don't think we'll ever figure out what is going what determines if it's one two and or three days after which just kind of adds to the fun of it because you just just don't know but if it is um, you know the right month the right moon phase the right time and they've all agreed then we do get to see it and it looks like smoke coming up off the bottom it's not you know, the, it's not shooting out, it's just slowly coming up off the bottom. And because Molokini has such a high concentration of cauliflower corals in certain places, it can be a whiteout. A diver can go into that and you can't even see your other, your other divers. Um, it's, it's just spectacular. I haven't seen it that big anywhere else. The concentration of cauliflower coral colonies there is just amazing. And this is what it looks like up close. You can see all the tiny little dots. Those are the eggs. And in this photo, you can see both the eggs and the sperm. The eggs are the dots. The sperm are way too tiny to see, so they're just that milky, milky backdrop there. And... Um, something that is really fun about this is that it plays a little trick on your mind because you are looking at this thing that looks like a stone and yet stuff is coming out of it. So it would be like if you were on land and you had a rock in front of you and smoke was coming out of it because the tissue is just too thin. You really don't see the tissue. You just see the stone part and your mind is just like, where is that coming from? And I've never, I'll never get used to that. It's always a strange, strange thing. Of course, fish um, come um, down to eat the eggs. Sometimes they come out of the water column. These are plankton feeders normally, but they're, you know, very excited about the, the eggs, and so they, they come down to the reef. And sometimes that's how we know that spawning is going to happen. 
um, that is a little clue that we sometimes get. Fish start to start to eat before we can really see anything happening, and then and then we know, okay, great, this is going to be one of those days. And uh, sometimes even bigger animals are brought in by this. Um, manta rays, whale sharks, we've had them show up during spawning times too. I don't think they're getting anything to eat necessarily, but that smell must really must really draw them in. Um, now I want you to know uh, what happened during last year's coral bleaching episode out there and whether we got to see spawning occur this year or not. So last year, um, in the spring, maybe even earlier, NOAA was predicting this warm water mass that was coming towards Hawaii. So here's Hawaii right here. And they said, it's coming. And they predicted horrible bleaching, just dire, uh, dire consequences from this. And even though they told us that, um, we still really couldn't imagine or picture what that meant. Um, and so what bleaching is, is remember these little microscopic um, algae in the tissue of the coral. You can see in this picture that the coral tissue itself is transparent, right? The, the, the zooxanthellae are what are giving the coral its color. So when bleaching occurs, what causes bleaching is the combination of the water temperature and the amount of UV radiation, when that combination gets just a little bit, you know, too high, the photosynthetic machinery in those little zooxanthellae um, goes haywire. And the zooxanthellae start to produce chemicals that are toxic to the coral, free radicals, things that the coral, that damage the coral tissue. And so the coral doesn't have any choice but to get rid of those algae. It expels them. And you can see, once the coral expels them, it's clear. Its tissue is clear after that. So these are two colonies. The one on the left still has its zooxanthellae, and the one on the right has expelled its zooxanthellae. Now, this does not mean that um, the colony is dead. What happened is last year, starting in June I, or July, we started to see the coral get a little bit pale, and then August, a little bit paler, um, and then one weekend in September, um, after the weekend, we went down, and we saw something that we had just never imagined. It was like it had snowed underwater. The, 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 it was brighter than any white we had ever seen. And this gives you an idea of how abundant cauliflower coral is in this particular spot at Molokini. And also, it shows you just how few of the colonies did not spawn, I mean, did not um, bleach. Over 80% of the colonies out there bleached. Um, but that did not mean they were dead. If you look um, closely at this photo, you can see the polyps are still there. And then up close, you can see they're, they're still there. So they're still able to capture the plankton out of the water, right? But again, remember, that's only a very small percentage of their nutrition. So as the bleaching conditions continued on, September, October, November, December, um, the corals were slowly starving because plankton capture isn't enough to feed them. And so um, when, I think it was about December when, it was, it was in December when conditions finally returned to a tolerable um, place for the for the corals and their symbiotic algae. And so the, the corals began to um, reacquire the zooxanthellae out of the water. So these zooxanthellae are just floating around in the water all the time. They're microscopic. We don't see them. We're bumping into them all the time. We have no idea. But they, um, the corals, they're all around the corals. So when the corals want them back, all they have to do is, is take them back. And we had never seen this before, but the way that they did it was they reacquired them from the base up. And, you know, that makes sense because down deeper, 
uh, they're not exposed to as much sunlight, so it's a safer place for them to start reacquiring. Maybe the tips of the corals are still exposed to a little bit too much UV, and it's not safe to take them back, to take those lysanthellae back in those areas, but it is safe to take them back in the center. So we started to see them acquire um, algae from the base up. And some uh, completely recovered. They acquired algae, or their, their symbiotic algae, their zoxanthellae, all throughout the colony and looked normal again. Some acquired it in deep, but the tips of the branches didn't um, acquire it in time. And so the tips of the branches of many corals out there now have this turf algae growing on them. It's the strangest thing. Um, the colony is alive down in here. There's living coral in here, but, but dead on the tips of the branches. Um, and, then, and then some colonies just didn't make it at all. In fact, the majority of colonies, of cauliflower coral colonies, did not make it through. They, they starved. They didn't make it. So that picture that I showed you of all those white colonies at Molokini uh, and, and anywhere that, that cauliflower coral bleached, most of those now look like this. And this is, um, this is what you know, many of the colonies look like that did, that did survive um, at a little later stage. So this is what they look like in February. So we were really concerned because that only left two months by the time spawning season would start. So we thought, geez, it, it, you know, it's February, they've finally recovered, and now they only have two months to produce eggs and sperm. Are they even going to spawn? Um, we were delighted to see that they did spawn. And because of the amount of spawning, we are assuming that some of the recovered colonies had to have participated in that. If only the colonies that didn't bleach at all were the ones that spawned, um, the spawning would have been much smaller because there are so few that didn't spawn at all. But because it was so big, we, um, we are assuming that some of the colonies that looked like you know, this picture must have, must have spawned as well. And so this is evolution in action. The colonies that spawned are the ones that resisted bleaching or recovered from bleaching. So those are the ones that are putting their genetic material out there. So that is uh, hopeful. I mean, it makes me hopeful thinking that the new generation of corals are going to be the ones that either resisted or recovered from bleaching conditions because surely um, more of those conditions are coming. Another species of coral, a totally different method of spawning is, um, is achieved by, uh, by rice coral. And this is the type of coral that spawns here at the aquarium when they have their um, coral spawning events. Uh, this coral is more um, conventional in its spawning technique. It spawns at night. The vast majority of corals spawn at night. And that's so that the UV radiation doesn't damage those fragile little coral and eggs, or, um, coral eggs and sperm when they when they're on the surface of the ocean. Um, they spawn after the new moon instead of after the full moon, like cauliflower coral does. And instead of releasing just loose eggs and sperm, uh, rice coral bundles their eggs and sperm together. So they take a whole bunch of eggs and package them. Then there's a polysaccharide little coating around those, and then they package the sperm around the eggs. And so they're separated by that, by that polysaccharide. And because the eggs have lipid in them, once these little bundles are released, they slowly rise to the surface of the ocean. It's very, very slow. And what happens when they all get to the surface is now they're all on the same plane, increasing their chances of coming into contact with each other rather than just being in the three-dimensional space of, of the ocean. 
And so the agitation of the ocean breaks apart those bundles. And this is a picture of those eggs under a microscope. Those are the eggs. Uh, the sperm have already come off. These are the eggs that are now coming apart from the bundle. So you can see how many eggs are in every one of these little bundles. And the bundles are just, you know, tiny. But of course, the eggs are even tinier. So there are probably thousands of eggs in every one of these bundles. And so some of the some of these eggs and sperm will uh, come into contact with each other, and there there will be fertilization. But many of the eggs and sperm never, um, you know, find each other. And so what is left is um, slicks like this on the surface the morning after. And for years, people have been calling the Coast Guard and calling DLNR accusing boats of emptying their holding tanks and um, reporting oil spills. Of course, this only happens in the summer, these oil spills. And, and so, um, but this is really from coral spawning. And this is inside Molokini, same thing. When it happens inside Molokini, you know, because of the curve, there's nowhere for it to go. So it all gets, uh, it all gets concentrated right there. Of course, in the snorkelers in the morning, you know, they have to navigate around that. Um, in Australia, where uh, over 100 species of corals spawn on the same night, the slicks can be seen from the air. They're huge, way bigger than anything that we have here, here in Hawaii. So the eggs and sperm that do find each other, uh, once fertilization takes place, the eggs begin dividing. Um, and during that time, they're just drifting wherever the current takes them. And so a few years ago, um, some Maui scientists, Donna Brown being one of them, um, did, a, did a study where they um, tracked coral larvae or coral eggs and sperm that had been spawned off of West Maui. And they tracked them through the night and um, found that they ended up over here on Lanai. So in 20 hours, they had drifted, I think, 15 miles or so. Um, so what that shows us is that um, there are certain reefs that are more important to coral reproduction uh, in the islands than others. This particular reef um, looks like it may seed areas of lanai, but imagine if a reef spawns down here and the current takes it in this direction. That's just a big loss. So some reefs are more important, you know, spawning wise than, than others. Um, it also shows the connectivity of the islands. You know, one, just because one island has fabulous coral, it may have more to do with where it's being seeded from than you know, its own um, coral generation. So the, the eggs and sperm that, um, that do come together and the eggs that are fertilized eventually, as soon as 24 hours sometimes, become coral larvae. And this is what a coral larva looks like. It's not very exciting. Um, it has cilia all around the edge. So once it becomes this type of, um, of larva with cilia, now it can move itself around. So at some point in its development, it begins to seek out a, a good habitat to live. And one of the cues that tells it what is good habitat comes from this coralline algae. And for some reason, these, uh, these coral larvae have evolved to seek out that chemical. And when they, when they detect that chemical, they're able to swim to it and, um, and, and begin life as a little coral. Um, you can see that an area like this, the chemicals being given off by an area like this, would not be attractive to a coral larva at all. There's no place for it to settle. It would quickly get overgrown by algae. So if it can't find a place like this, if it doesn't detect a chemical from this type of um, coralline algae, and it, its time is up as far as a larva goes, then it just dies. 
It only has a limited amount of time to t detect this chemical and then um, settle to the bottom. But once it does find that, um, that chemical Q, it'll swim to the bottom. It will set itself down, glue itself to the bottom, and then it will begin secreting a new little calcium carbonate skeleton. And of course, we don't see these at all. You can see how microscopic they are. Um, and you know, once they, you know, they start out as one, but then eventually they're going to divide into two, or another one's going to bud off the initial one, and eventually you have the beginning of a new little colony. We don't really see these colonies until, I mean, new coral colonies until they're maybe a centimeter. We don't even notice them until they're a certain size. And even at this size, we have no idea what that's going to be. That might be a cauliflower coral. That might be an antler coral. We don't know. Um, and so at these stages, um, spawning does not begin right away. A colony has to achieve a certain size before it can, before it's ready to spawn. In the beginning, of course, all the energy is going into growth, right? The last thing a colony wants is to be overgrown by an adjacent coral or algae, so it's all about increasing in size in the beginning. So it really isn't about until you know, four or five years that a cauliflower coral colony is ready to, um, to spawn. And at that point, it begins producing eggs and sperm, and um, then it gets to participate in adult activities on the reef with the other, with the other mature cauliflower coral colonies. Um, so there's, there's something that that I really want you guys to know, and it's that these corals, these summer spawning corals, are so numerous along, the, uh, along our coastlines that when they spawn, they spawn so many eggs and sperm that we are able to smell that from land. So even if you don't um, dive or snorkel and you never see coral spawning, um, you are still able to know whether spawning has occurred by this scent on land. And I know some of you have smelled this and know exactly what it is, but I bet a lot of you have smelled it and just thought it was extra oceany. I bet you just thought it was the ocean. Yes. Yes. Oh, I love that smell. Maybe we're not talking about the same thing. <laughs> It's an intense ocean smell. Maybe some, some people uh, describe it as soapy. Um, and, and so that's telling you, yeah, that's telling you um, that, that spawning has, has occurred. Um, specifically, what is causing that smell? Does anybody know what that, what that is? Yes, who knows that? Who knows that? <laughs> it's, it's specifically the sperm, not the eggs. Yeah. Yeah, I really wanted to call this talk, sperm is in the air, but I, <laughs> I didn't think Colleen would, would go for that. So I have always wondered, um, always wondered what the Hawaiians thought when they smelled this smell. Because I don't think they could have seen coral spawning, the night coral spawning. Even if they held a torch, you know, right along the water's edge, I, these corals, see, to me, seem like they would be too deep for, for, for them to ever have known what that, or to ever have seen it. Maybe they knew. Um, but um, I just this week um, heard from my friend Christy Vale, who told me that she had uh, spoken to a, a Hawaiian man who spent a lot of his childhood on the east end of Molokai with his grandparents. And he told her that his grandma told him that when they smelled that smell, it meant that it was shark pupping season, which we see that all the time. Uh, in the summer, we see pregnant females, we see babies, but I never would have thought to link those two. But 
but it's uh, it makes it makes perfect sense. Um, so I have a little assignment for you guys, which is in the next three months, uh, during the times of the full moon and the new moon, try to see if you can notice that smell. And if you do, you're going to know something that I feel like everybody, I wish everybody on the island noticed this and knew about it. But if you notice it, um, you're going to know several things. You're going to know that it's shark pupping season. You're going to know that uh, one species of coral has released billions of eggs and sperm into the water. You're going to know that some of those eggs and sperm have found each other and are now developing into, into larvae, little coral larvae. And you're going to know that, um, that the corals have done their part. And it's a great reminder, I think, when, when we smell that smell, that, that we, if we want to see more corals, we just need to make sure that the water is clear and there's a sediment-free place for those little larvae to attach. Um, and you'll know that um, the next generation of corals will be coming to a reef near you soon in the next, in the next few months. So. Um, so I'd be thrilled if even one of you noticed that uh, this coming spawning season. So thank you.